I love that it says that. <laughs> so I'll continue to let people in, but I think we can get started if you all are ready. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Francine. Of course, we're super excited. I'm Francine. I'm the manager here at Heaven Gallery, and I am so excited to welcome all the artists of Nide Aki, Nide Ya. I'm currently in the space with the exhibition behind me, and in lieu of being here in person, they have so graciously and beautifully prepared a presentation uh, and talk for us to go through the exhibition um, virtually together. So I'm really excited to hand it off. Um, definitely feel free to get started. Um, and we're so excited to begin this with you guys. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Teresa Villanueva, and I'm one of the artists in the group curated exhibition um, alongside Caro Bedoy. Hi there. Maximiliano Cervantes. Hello, good morning. And Sophie Lopez. Hi, how's it going? Thank you all for joining us this beautiful Saturday afternoon. So Ni de Quine Ya is a collective of Mexican-American lens-based artists in Chicago who use their artistic labor to raise questions of workers' rights, immigration policy, and the horrors of American history. Today, there's a slow momentum with the inclusion um, of Latinx artists in established institutions. However, inclusion nor acceptance is not the main priority for the artists included in Nida Quinina Ya. As the proverb suggests, we are neither from near nor from, from there. We exist in the borderland and Chicago, visualizing the terrors and pleasures of domestic lives. Taking matters into one's hands is a mode of survival for the families represented in this exhibition. On another level, the artist takes matters into their own hands through archives and photography. They award agency upon themselves and blur the lines between artisan and fine artists to craft their own history, a history that has been forcefully taken from them. Oh, so sorry. For Caro, this abstract displacement is mapped out with the inclusion narration of her family's somatic archive. Sophie, a daughter of undocumented parents, questions of ability and authority of the document itself. Myself, with, her, with my environmental portraits, documents the flux of my domestic life. Maximiliano uses the camera as a tool to document him and his father tirelessly performing through the tradition of labor. Ourselves as the artist in Ikini de Ya uses their dual identities as Mexican Americans to create a breathing presentation of their domestic spaces. We broke down into different categories of what our working exhibition represents. As a collective, each artist would provide inside each other's work, posing questions for um, Becoming, which will be led by Max, Immigration, Relocation, led by Sophie, and Visual Language of Labor, led by Pat. Hello all, so I'll be talking about Becoming and how we are better understanding our surroundings. So when I first saw this photo um, of Sophie, I had to think about which way it should be read. My initial impulse was to look from top to bottom to suggest that you have put this photo out into the world. But if it's read from the bottom up, it's as if the photo has been taken by the person who lives inside. It is a kind of disorienting cycle when I first saw it and I, and I was debating which way and going back and forth and back and forth. When I refer to the title, I'm relieved to find out that this may be some type of ritual um, uh, from indigenous lands or an Aztec ritual. So my question was, how has sacred rituals influenced your way of working? And how has it introduced you to a new way of thinking about your surroundings? Thank you so much, Max, for your analysis. Um, yeah, I think with this work, especially with such an impactful title, I was thinking a lot about how do I get to the root of my history? Um, and that proving to be a so much more difficult journey than I anticipated, because I also, I don't know a lot about my family history. I don't know a lot about my roots. Um, I even struggle to remember some of my aunt's names. So it's, it's very disconnected um, for what I know as my own family history, much less my genealogical history. Um, 
especially as being somebody who grew up in the Midwest suburbs it, and not close to like a borderland or like a Mexican identifying community, it was really hard for me to even um, like dip my toe into like, is it all right for me to even be researching this? Um, so then I, I just took a deep dive um, and started learning more, Googling uh, without hesitation. And so the title itself is an offering of Kualikwe. And what I'm offering in itself is Catholicism and my family archive, as we see on this um, poster that I'm putting on the front door uh, and leaving out uh, to endure the weather or very much less, maybe it's me taking it back as you suggested by the sequence. Um, and being very performative or playful with the way that I'm collaging images, the way that I'm constructing them um, has kind of lessened the degree of whether what I'm doing is right or wrong, whether I should stay cut and dry to the history and to the facts. Um, this playfulness allows me just to come up with whatever and propose it as an idea rather than, um, again, fact. Um, and then I think very much to the theme of this category, the idea of becoming uh, is taking in everything about your environment between what your family home life is like, as well as all the other external people that you're meeting. Um, as well, it's like a recognition of how you understand immigration policy. Um, I'm somebody who comes from a neighborhood in which not a lot of people look like me. Um, so therefore the idea of undocumented parents is never discussed or has not been discussed within my friend groups. It's something that's very shrouded in secrecy. Um, so you kind of just understand there's some things that you talk about and there's some things that you don't talk about. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And if I remember, this is sort of like in winter and this is sort of like you peeking out into the cold. Um, is that correct or is yeah. that completely off? <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. And similarly, um, when I first saw this photo of Jennifer's as well, um, votamos en honor a nuestro mamá y papá, translated as we voted in honor of our mom and dad, um, which was a recent picture taken uh, during a time that we all urgently had to vote. Um, and when I look at this picture, I'm thinking about the practicality of the objects and how they function in our domestic spaces. So the voting stickers that um, are given to after the voting ballot are used as tags for images of your parents uh, on the mirror and the Virgin of Guadalupe is used as a weight to prevent these lottery tickets from falling over. So I'm curious as to how your family's genesis informed this still life. Thank you so much for posing this question, Max. Um, yeah, with that being said, um, having creating the still life really made me think about each individual item and photograph um, kind of symbolizing and kind of reframing that my family birthed me the right to be able to pursue so many wonderful opportunities here in the United States that were not, they were not able to in Mexico. Creating the self life thing, creating a uh, homage and like an honor to my parents that I was able to, for, for, to vote for them, for, for, to vote for their rights as Americans, as myself as an American citizen. And thanks to my entire family, I was able to go to school and I was inspired to pursue art and in so many roles as an artist, educator, organizer, writer, curator, lecture, researcher, and beyond. Utilizing the still life has created a communicative tool for social change and awareness and addressing the politics of our rights and representation. My grandmother, who was the first to migrate to the United States, influenced my parents to stay in Chicago when they found out my mother was pregnant with me. They knew if I was born in the United States, it meant that I would have these opportunities to have more options academically and financially than they ever did in Mexico. This decision alone made by thousands of immigrants seeks to desire, opportunity, and a daily struggle to dream and survive. Like other immigrants, the parents works endlessly to provide a better life for the family in the US. In the US, when the US rejects Latinx migrants, restricts their participation in society, and spreads accusations to Latin America, and Mexico in particular, is to blame for the economic woes experienced by American citizens, I feel a responsibility to respond to my work. And I never knew what life meant as a Mexican-American woman until I became an adult. Having undocumented immigrant parents whose primary goal is to make sure I receive the best education has always been my priority. 
Um, education has really given me a valuable thing for me to allow me to grow, learn, and achieve absolutely anything that I could possibly imagine. And since survival in the United States, I think my parents were working day and night to grant me this opportunity to begin my experience and knowledge of the world. And as my parents always stressed to me while growing up, si se puede. Yes, it can be done. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for that powerful description. Um, I think it's a really great segue into our next category about immigration and relocation. Um, migration has been historically a very innate behavior with, within like the human experience. Even the word migrant is such like a powerful image conjuring word. When you think of it, you kind of think of uprootedness, you think about rupture, you think about pain, like painfulness um, that's associated with the idea of migrating to leave the homeland or leaving an, an idea of home. Um, and allow me to introduce our next artist if we can go to the next slide. Um, awesome. Where we have Caro and her next piece, Lo Que Dejan. When I saw this image, it was just shrouded in so much mystery, the way that the light is illuminating the room um, and all the different scenarios that I'm like going through in my head as to how do we encounter an image like this? Um, if, God, if you can give us a little bit more of a description to that, that would be awesome. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Sophie. Um, so this photograph was taken during the COVID-19 pandemic. Once the pandemic hit in March, I immediately ran away to Mexico. And I spent a lot of time in my aunt, my mother's sister's home. And during my time there, I realized that the house was completely jam packed with objects of several family members, not only mine, and just their stuff like left behind there, stored away, collecting dust. And one of those objects was a snake called Dimitri. <laughs> and this snake belonged to my aunt's son, my cousin, and it rested in a really sad aquarium. It was just there not really being paid attention to and just restricted to a really confined space. And it really made me think of the memories and dues and debts that these objects hold and the bothersome of collecting all of these objects for your family member that don't have a foreseeable return date. Um, so I decided to bring out the snake and photograph it within a created obstructed space with the light and just think about what's left behind and how hard that must be for our loved ones that are also left behind to just wait for us. Yeah, um, question, uh, kind of like how do we see the passage of time within this image, whether metaphorically or more literally, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the passage of time I feel is represented by not only furniture, belongings, clothing, like at, in this specific situation, it's a living thing, it's an animal. And our loved ones just stand behind patiently waiting and holding a place for us. Like I said, with no foreseeable return date, since my cousin is undocumented and probably will never return to Mexico my aunt still holds a space for him through this snake, feeds it every single week, and holds on to the hope that one day she will see her son again. Yeah, thank you so much for that insight. Also, just the title is very moving. Like it has a lot of like action towards it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think uh, as a way of a segue, uh, I think our work is very reflective of the metaphorical border. Um, as you were talking about, it's like the, what I mean by that is like the this side versus that side um, in creating a clear divide. Um, your previous piece talking so much more about like the homeland and people who are in some way stagnant in time or stuck in a period of hoping and longing. Um, with this next image, the title is referencing the way that my mom would answer the phone uh, whenever I posed the question, is this Elvie Granados? And she was very much like adamant about informing her brother, you never say yes, because somebody could scam you. 
um, you always say, this is she speaking or this is he speaking. Um, and while that is seen, that does sound or seem a little silly, um, years from like learning this, I realized it was a mode of survival. Um, it was a way to, I guess, in a way, like evade fraud or to have an extra layer of security that is within your own control. Uh, especially my mom, when she migrated to Chicago, she was here alone, a 20 something person. Actually the person who's in the image is what she looked like. Um, and coming from a family of like eight other siblings, she was the baby. So everybody was super overprotective and they're like, I don't know what's gonna happen to Elvia. Um, so then by me taking this action of taping her photo onto myself, I'm talking about the idea of like masking yourself or be creating or becoming this persona of my mother, inheriting those strong traits and qualities. Um, yeah, and especially as being in a, in a foreign country or a foreign environment in which you have to continually assimilate but also create boundaries um, and think about who you are as a person and what you wanna keep and what you wanna give away in the sense of becoming more Americanized or keeping your roots. Um, it's something that's like a really difficult internal battle, but yeah. Thank you so much for that, Sophie. Um, to continue on to our next section, our final section is the visual language of labor, which all of us have our own imagery associated with this topic, no matter what your location is, socioeconomic background. I feel like most Latinx people, if not all, um, have an association with labor. And some examples of that within our own work, if we could go on to the next slide. Um, through this photo by Maximiliano, had a sand of bench with your father. When I look at this photo, I think of how Latinx men are limited to build intimate relationships with their fathers, mainly through physical labor and not really able to talk about emotions, form intimate bonds like that, but instead through sweat and heat and strenuous work. And I was just sort of hoping that Max could speak to the tedious tasks and how they have affected the relationship with your father. Yeah, thank you. So I started this project with my father um, in 2019. And this is one of the first images that I sort of really um, saw and I, I thought I would start this project with him. And so it has been a continuous collaboration with him um, in my process of photographing um, and looking back as to the ways that we have lived um, and how we use this way of living as a mode of survival. And really that, like you said, labor and um, labor is a tradition within our family and in many families. Um, so here we're repurposing this bench that we found in an alley. Um, and it's just something that we would just normally do to find furniture or to find other things in the alley um, to use so we can save money and not buy things. Um, and the whole conceptual basis is around how-to books. And in how-to books, we're traditionally sort of supposed to learn how to do something and how to perform a task. But within our pictures, we don't really learn how to do anything. All we learn about is the relationship between me and him and to how we exchange our gaze, how we interact with our bodies together um, and how our bodies are also very different. Um, so, uh, and similarly in the next photograph, um, can change the slide. Um, I titled this Master Day Laborer. So Master Day Laborer is a day laborer and is somebody who can do all things. So my dad is not only a father and a blue collar worker at an aerospace manufacturer, but he's also a carpenter, a roofer, a painter, a plumber, a mechanic, a like do everything type of guy. And that is not only to save money within our own household, but also to make money for other, on other people's um, property or for whatever they want to be done. Um, 
So this image really shows our process of image making and also our multiple uses of material. So whenever we are photographing, I usually use long exposures. And during this time, I have him stare at me and not at the camera. So again, we're exchanging this gaze, but it's only through photography. And through this like image making process, we're able, he's able to stare at me for however seconds I keep the shutter going. And he usually gets uncomfortable or he just laughs and just breaks his pose. Um, so we have this sort of genuine interaction in between. Um, so the tarp here is used in multiple cases. Um, the tarp is used traditionally as a workspace um, to keep things clean and to be able to sort of fold everything up at the end of the day and throw it in the trash. Um, here it's also used as a photographic backdrop. Um, and more urgently, it could be used as shelter for immigrants crossing the border. Um, so I'm interested in this sort of multiplicity of uses of material and sort of how they seem this like this mundane thing that you buy, but they have this, they're so urgent to other people's uses. Thank you, Max, for that powerful description. Um, moving on to Jennifer's work. Mamá la trabajadora, my mom the hard worker. This photograph is really powerful and it makes me think of the long hours and unsafe conditions that our parents have to be in in order to make a home and give and provide for their children not only what they need, everything they could want. And I was hoping Jennifer could speak to her family sacrifices of quality time and able to provide for you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Carol. Um, what can I say about my mom? <laughs> she is definitely a hard worker. Um, my mother works two jobs. Her, her first job being my mother, who loves her family, cooks and cleans, and then her second job as a general laborer at a printing and mailing factory. Pre-pandemic, she would wait or she would work eight hours a day for seven days a week. And that would also be because of um, the amount of overtime that she will take. Um, and any opportunity she will get, she would just work, work, and work. And now, because of the pandemic and social distancing, she works 12 hours a day for four days a week and sometimes even scatters to longer hours or shorter hours. But it Creating this image kind of reflected on my time during high school when I witnessed both of my parents losing their jobs. And that led to my mother coming here to the printing and mailing factory, which required to spend twice as much time inside a super hot and noisy factory. Being there, it, it implemented this fear of like, what will what happen to my mom? And when she used to work every day, it was really hard because I only had the opportunity to see her in the morning before school or work. And then late at night when we both come back after a really long day, it was really difficult not seeing her. And it always caused me to assume the worst. And every day, even to this day, I'm constantly worried. I think about both of my parents in fear of losing them either through deportation or sudden illness. Despite living with them for 33 years, I did not have the opportunity to see or even spend quality of time with my parents. Although my mother works very long hours, now that she's working 12 hours a day for four days a week, um, that actually was able to create some time together um, as a family more than we ever did when I was born. And I admire my mother. She works pretty damn hard. And whether working as my mother or a general laborer, my mom prides herself in her labor because she knows it provides a better life for our family in the United States. Thank you, Jennifer. That piece really speaks to me and really like impacts me with how much I can relate to it. Um, through this piece called Muñeca, which is also a photograph of my mom, I feel like I'm also speaking on similar things and the effects of labor onto the body. I think it's really important to note like your mom is a lot younger than mine and I feel like unfortunately these, this hard work really does take a toll on the body. 
and has long-term consequences to it. Um, my mother was in a devastating work accident in 2017, which left her with torn ligaments in both of her legs and an injured neck. Her life was put on pause and her work did not want to take responsibility over the accident, even though they were the ones pushing her with a 15 hour work day and no break. And in my eyes, she really mirrored these dolls that we had in our home in Mexico. She longed for them for years and she would always say that she was gonna bring them to our home in Chicago and that she was gonna show them off. But when we finally brought them back, she didn't show them off. She just had them on shelves collecting dust with the sheet over their heads. And I'm like, what was the point of relocating them and not enjoying them, not enjoying their life, you know? And I found this parallel between my mom and her dolls because after the work accident, she was just at home waiting for something to change, waiting for a resolution or an outcome to this accident. And I find it really sad that she worked so hard her entire life to be able to provide for us. And when, she, when her labor was useless, when her body was useless, her life had no point at, to some certain extent, like her whole life has been put on a pause which is extremely frustrating. And it's just really scary to think about that. This labor doesn't come without a price. And... Thank you so much, Petal, for sharing that. I definitely see the parallel between all of us in this collective. One moment to go to the next slide. Um, so the collective work in Virginia de Ya uses photography to document, be documented, and visualize generational trauma and continues to carry us to this day. And oh, but then we'll just exchange it to express gratitude towards our families and utilize the camera as a tool for visual language of labor. With that being said, we do thank you for joining us this Saturday afternoon. Um, we want to thank Heaven Galley for giving us an opportunity to shape, showcase our work and hosting the conversations. Now we do welcome you for a Q&A session if anyone has any pending questions to the artists and myself. Hi, so we do have a question. Um, if Sophie could talk a little bit more about this backdrop piece that's actually centered here in the gallery, we'd love to know more. Yeah, of course. Um, here, I'll wait. So there's like an image for that. So people know what we're referencing. Uh, so this is a piece that I've titled Tracing Home, uh, which is a bigger body of work, but essentially it is about three yards by two yards of um, printed uh, blackout curtain fabric. It's supposed to be a backdrop that is typically posed between natural landscapes of the Midwest suburbia. The images themselves are composed of my mother and I. Um, in the way that I shot the, these sequence of photos is my mo I posed my mother in five or four different types of poses. And then based off of those images, I mimicked her poses um, uh, just by looking at the images. So it wasn't like she posed one and then I posed the same. It was just uh, looking at the image and referencing that and mimicking the pose from the image rather than from herself. Um, it's supposed to speak to the duality that I, <laughs> the very toxic duality that I created between myself and my mother. I had encountered her archive when we finally went back to Mexico after 25 years. Um, and the images in that box were all of her when she was a young 20 something. Um, and it was really easy for me to try to compare myself to her. 
uh, which eventually, which never is a good thing. You shouldn't compare yourself to others because everybody has a different track in their life. Um, but especially because she's my mother and because I see her as such a role model and a great figure and somebody who I do not want to disappoint, um, it was easy for me to put myself in a very nasty binary, um, especially just because that was a homecoming for herself. Um, and then I'm still trying to figure out what my identity is because I'm still like a young 20 something um, and figure out what home looks like, what home feels like um, and how to feel comfortable within my own skin. Um, but yeah, I think it talks a lot about generational success and the pressures uh, that we place upon ourselves uh, to succeed or have a form of brown excellence. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I think that's very much like the Latinx experience. And when I talk about that, it's very much just like the, the combining of these two worlds of what a Mexican identity is, what American identity is, and what's the in-between space. Um, and how do we become like a recognition to that? And how do we deal with all that information? Um, yeah, thank you for posing your question. I don't know if there's any more questions based off of that, but. Oh, Sarah posed a question and I will read it out loud. Um, a big part of the work requires exploration through family members. I'm wondering how this usually takes place and how this intimacy of exploring creates relationships. Um, I can take that question and someone else can maybe answer it if they want to. Um, so usually, uh, so I guess the question is asking is like maybe how we start this um, sort of relationship and how we explore it. Um, so I guess for me, I'm just sort of like looking back at my, like how we function as a family um, and how we used to do things. So as a family, we would all work together and we would sort of like always do this every day or every weekend and would, wouldn't really have like time to take a lot of family vacations or to sort of um, do, I don't know, normal family things. Um, so I guess one thing I remember like very vividly as a kid is being like going back to school after summer break and being asked, what did you do for the summer? And so like everybody was sort of saying how they went there and went here. And I was so embarrassed to answer because all we did for the summer was work. Um, so part of that sort of remembering is a, very much a part of my work um, into when I'm looking back at how I create these images with my father um, and sort of, so it's about sort of recreating that space um, and also sort of having that relationship with, have, like recreating that space opens up this relationship with him to provide us with conversation during the picture taking um sort of we talk about all of these different things in our past um and in the present so i guess photography is just sort of this tool to open up this relationship with, uh to to make it deeper with between me and my father yeah i would also love to answer that question um documenting my family members it kind of just started with my grandmother um, it's kind of hard to see in this image, but it's like all the way in the far right, right next to Muñeca. Um, but essentially, it's, it all started with my grandmother. Um, she has chronic kidney disease, and she's been in, through dialysis for the last 10 years, which is pretty remarkable for somebody who's in dialysis. There's not many hard things to do. Um, and having to document my grandmother kind of opened up doors. Uh, to our relationship and then from then on made me kind of idolize like how powerful independent and hardworking she really is and then with focusing like my relationship with my grandmother um, I focused on my relationship with my mother and my relationship with my mother was extremely difficult like <laughs> a little we kind of hated each other at one point but then having to document her her life um, having to document her life and like the work that she does and just admiring her for all the sacrifices that she's done I think we met 
we finally met in the middle, we were able to document our relationship and the way that I also idolized her the same way I idolized my grandmother. Um, and my father was absolutely against me documenting everything about our daily lives because um, he was embarrassed. And I don't blame him. I mean, the whole, I understand where he comes from as like an undocumented immigrant father. Um, but I think, I think after, also because of the images that it created, it created a conversation, it created a community of other people who's also experiencing similar things. It kind of opened our relationship too. And now I'm like really excited to even share that we're collaborating with each other and kind of creating more work about our familiar histories and archives and where we are today. I'll add in my experience very quickly. Um, it was a strange experience. I feel like my mom has been the most supportive um, through me exploring and like it's been helping our relationship even more because like she's done this to support me and to help me. And she sees that creating this work is doing that exactly. Um, but other than my mom, I've actually received a lot of pushback from my family that they didn't know I felt this way about our family history. And in a, in a way to like gloss over it and deny it, um, I've actually like had some tools on my relationships through creating the work, but I still think it's worth it to create it and, you know, like talk about our generational trauma because it's not gonna get resolved unless it's discussed. And we can move on to the next question. And I think this probably only refers to me because um, <laughs> all three of you are from Chicago, but the question is from Janet Lopez. For the artists that are Chicago transplants, can you speak on the experience of moving to Chicago and finding your community here in Chicago or SAIC? Um, so yeah, we are all SAIC um, graduates. Uh, Sophie's almost graduating. She has a semester or a year left. Uh, but nonetheless, we will all be SAIC graduates. Um, so I guess for me, it's just sort of like, uh, I don't know, I think you just sort of gravitate towards maybe people who, who uh, not only look like you, but think like you. Um, and so I think I had class with Sophie and I also had class with Jennifer and we just sort of, I think, recognize each other's work and sort of create a dynamic out of that. Um, I think it took a little bit more to like become friends with Jennifer because I had two classes with her. Um, but it's also just like the mentorship that is involved with uh, your professors and sort of seeing that there are similarities within your work and that it's important to sort of create a, a dialogue with each other. Um, so for example, this is how this whole sort of collective and group show has come together um, through like the recommendation of our mentor. Um, and so me and Jennifer sort of discussed this and, um, me and met a couple of times and decided to also include uh, other artists. So yeah, I think it's just about listening to your mentor, but also like listening to your own instincts and who you're, like, you gravitate to as friends. Um, and really like building on that because it does, it, it takes work to do that. Like it, it's not just sort of like all pieced together for you. Um, so you have to attend class. So that's also a part of work and you, you'll make friends. Um, so there's some effort that's involved in it. Um, but I don't know if they can answer that question too, or maybe because they're all from here and I'm from Texas. Um, transplant <laughs> oh yeah that's right you moved back I have yes a very strange migration pattern um I was born here but then I moved back to Mexico and my earliest memories are in Mexico but then I had to move back here and it was a really strange experience because I was put into elementary school in Logan Square 
and it was a lot of Latinx kids surrounding me, but I didn't know that they spoke Spanish. <laughs> I was like, they're American. Why would they speak Spanish? And it was a really scary experience. And I think just to echo what Max was saying, it's really important to like put yourself out there and be vulnerable, not be afraid to speak on your experiences and the way that you think, because you will find people that think like you too. And it's just sort of like a magnet, like you'll find the people that understand you, that see you and value you and your work. Yeah, I think there's just like so many similarities, no matter where you're from. Like I met uh, Caro through like a mutual friend and we would like have lunch together, but we would talk about like our high school experiences. And it's like, everyone is almost kind of the same. And we, we have these insider jokes and we get it and we get like, um, all of these sort of dynamics within growing up within a Latinx like community. Um, so I think it's just, it, it's somewhat natural that it happens that we're all together in conversation and sort of as artists. Yeah, during those lunches, I remember something like we were talking about our experiences and just like laughing. And I remember Max saying one time like, oh, I feel like I knew you. Like, I don't know how, but I feel like I know you already. And that really like struck me and like stood out to me because it's like, yeah, you're right. Like we do know each other because we know what we've been through. I want to say. Yeah. Building onto this conversation, um, what really makes us like so compatible with each other is that also like we have reoccurrent themes throughout all of our work or we all talk about the same thing or something that's very similar, but we all do it in our own way. And in no form is it like a competition to see who can like outdo the other, or out talk the other, or have more theory behind whatever idea we're expressing. Rather, we share resources, um, we talk openly, we talk through ideas. And I think that's like something that's so generous that we found within this like little, little community, but it's a very generous community. Um, and I don't know. I'm just so fortunate to know these. Now it's just like a love session. I'm so fortunate to know all of you. Uh, but in reality, that's very true. Yes, thank you for that. Um, does anybody else have any other questions that they'd like to ask the artists? Well, if not, um, if you guys feel like you've uh, wrapped up what you want to say, it's been such a lovely talk and it's been such a delight to get to know more about the works and hear your personal experiences and explanations of the work and also your relationship with each other. So we are so appreciative of the show and also you taking the time to explain all of this. And also we're open today and tomorrow if anyone hasn't seen it, IRL, wear your mask. We're gonna be here one to six today and one to five tomorrow. Yeah, go see it. <laughs> Ew, it's a beautiful experience. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. So hopefully we can see some visitors come in today from this talk. We'd love to see everyone here. And once again, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. for joining us today. And thank you, Heaven Gallery, for hosting us. Thank you. Have a lovely day.